Um, I will talk about AB's situation now. AB came to us uh, a few years ago and did this process. You want me to tell the story or are you going to tell it? No, you go for it. All right. Um, and uh, look, he did this process and he loved it, he said, I enjoy it. But as you, as you would have gained from yesterday, AB likes to take things to the nth degree because he's an angry man. No, he's not. <laughs> but he said, no, no, that's not enough. He said, uh, I think what they're doing is criminal. And uh, I would agree. So he made a complaint to the police. He actually went to the police and he said, uh, I believe there's been fraud on these accounts. He tried with two, um, a very large Amex, $129,000 Amex and about a $12,000 other bill. And um, he made the complaint to the police. He got a, a young constable who had no idea what AB was talking about. He went with our letters that are this thick, the file. Uh, and he said, look, I, I may make a claim on my insurance. And my insurance company have said that I need to make a, uh, a police uh, report, uh, which then makes it a criminal matter. So the guy issued the Queensland Police Report number and away he went. He then went to FOS, which is the Financial Ombudsman Services, and made a complaint there. That's a great idea too. So if anyone here is doing the process, it's a good idea because it stops the banks calling you and uh, it should stop them listing you on VITA. He also made a, plaint, a complaint to COSL. Uh, he then had his lawyers write to them and say, this is now a criminal matter uh, and we'd like it resolved. The banks didn't like it when it went from a civil matter to a criminal matter. So the banks then wrote back and, and said, well, uh, look, sign this stat deck, uh, or no, give us a, a further report and we'll investigate it. They investigated it and came back and said, look, sign this stat deck and this very thick confidentiality agreement and uh, we'll, we'll uh, deal with the matter. 30 days later, he got a letter from both of them, different organisations, saying that the matter had been investigated and he was no longer liable. <coughs> now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it was because of our tricky four-stage process. I think it's more that it became a criminal matter and they didn't want this to go any further. So it's not on the technicalities and the tricky stuff that we wrote. This is all a game. And anyone who's going to sit here and tell you that they wrote this really tricky instrument, I've got a big chin, you come and show me, because I'm yet to see any evidence of that. So that's what he did, uh, and the beautiful part was that 30 days after Amex in particular said you can forget the loan and keep this letter as verification of that, they sent him a new platinum card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are the risks? Uh, well, the, well, the risks are that you could get listed on Vita. Um, AB says that there's like a, at least a 50% chance. I don't think it's that much. AB deals with the ones that get listed, so he probably feels like that. But in doing this tour, I've had so many people come up and go, man, I've had nothing. I've done the process, I've had nothing. And I think to me it's a matter of staying on the front foot and responding to them in a timely fashion. But there is the risk that you will get listed on VITA. Does everyone know what VITA is? Okay, so it used to be the Credit Reference Association of Australia, then it was Baycorp. Now it's VITA. So if you want to go and get credit anywhere else, first thing that they're going to do is do what? They're going to check on VITA. Okay? The uh, credit cards I talked about, I've written off about 330000 so far. Um, every single one of them, I've got letters completely um, waiting in debt. So, but I was listed, I got five defaults, and my life collapsed when I got those crosses. So I had to shift, and I went hard for beta. Now I got all five removed, again, all in writing, and I can show you. I haven't put them on here, just to, actually, I said the mark, he just couldn't work it out to put them into the slot. <laughs> True story. <laughs> so um, what happened is I fought them for nine months, and it took me nine months to get rid of them, and I did use a lawyer at the time. I wouldn't now. Um, there's not many lawyers I like, but there's a couple. But at the same time, it took nine months to get off. So if you're really determined and you're worried about it, there is a process to do it, and you will get through it. Most people, though, now realise a black or a red mark on a fictional list ultimately doesn't matter. They don't mind if you're out of 100 grand with the credit cards at the time. But it's true, I did get a new credit card. So it's been six days later. And for my wife as well, too. Did you use it? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have. The other thing that you can mark, this may touch on a minute, but unjust enrichment. Unjust enrichment is a really important um, aspect of law. It's also called quantum merit. And that means that if, if you obtain some enrichment, you've got something for a service and haven't paid for it, then you've been unjustly enriched. The, it's, it comes under, and I don't think it's Jerry, I'm not in the room maybe, um, it comes under the equity jurisdiction in law. Now, they have a very specific clause in that, in that um, act that says you can only come to the table, the equity table, with clean hands. So when we fight it in court, we just argue, well, they can't argue equity jurisdiction because they haven't come to the table with clean hands. They created the digits, da -da -da, done, 10,000 bucks. 
We then pay them 100 bucks a month of real money, physical money, out of the account, you can prove it, you can track it, you can reconcile the bank account, it's gone out. They've now got 2,000 bucks in interest on money that never existed. That's the fraud, it's not just misrepresentation, it's fraud, it's criminal, okay? If you find someone who's willing to prosecute it, i.e. a barrister like Jerry, it's fraud. It can actually go to court, but no one has got the balls to do it, or the money because courts are just all about business. So what happens is that argument is completely negated in court now. They can't use unjust enrichment. Because the other thing you've got to have when there's a, a loss, okay, the evidence which is not there, they can't show there's any loss because they never they created it to start with, but there's no victim. So the unjust enrichment, sure, I've got a big three places there, you've got Harvey Norman's. Awesome. Guess what? He's happy because he got paid in fictional digits in this market system. He's happy. There's no victim. So the bank says, I've lost all this money. We said, fantastic. If you've lost the money, you show it to us. We're honourable. We'll pay you that money back. All you've got to do is show us a copy of a contract. Oops, doesn't exist. Never did. There's not one of you in this room has ever had a credit card contract ever. You had an offer and acceptance that you signed. They never, they never signed it. You might get it back from the credit team or the legal team the arrears team, whatever it is. So it's a corporation, so there's, there can't be a contract as such. And then secondly, there's no victim. There's no, they can't reconcile the loss. They never had it, can't show it. There's no contract, no victim, and you're out. But you've got to get into court with someone confident to argue, because what happens is the judge turns up, they turn up with all their statements, and they go, look, there it is, you did it all. Of course you've got the money. It's all sitting there. We don't have to prove you have the money. The statements are enough. And the judge will almost certainly rule on that unless you have someone confident to argue it. And the difference is that these documents, these statements are created, they're internal documents created by the bank to support their case. I can create the same internal documents to support my case with zero balance. So they negate each other, but the bank always wins because there's a joint that's which Mark will talk about as well, a financial joint between banks and the courts and all the rest of it. So that's why having someone either A, the knowledge to do it yourself and really have the ability to stand up and say, Fuck off and go to court. They hate that. They do not want to see you in court. Because if they lose, if I win, they lose. It's a precedent case for all of you to take over as well. So I've never got to the case, to, to the point of actually going to court with these guys, because they capitulate and they have done six, numerous times. Six, there's been six times where, and it's never been by the lender, it's always been by debt collectors. The lenders won't touch it. Yeah. Um, the debt collectors, the day before court, uh, have we, we've put in what's called an interim defence, which is not a defence, it's an interim defence. So under disclosure, we've asked them for all sorts of information. The day before court, on all six occasions, they issued notices of discontinuance. Yeah. And with a notice of discontinuance, you can then uh, clear your visa listing. That's right. And, and now we've also got Jerry who will go to court and for it. You've got to pay, obviously, but there's a certain level of people that can afford to pay. And we'll talk about forming action groups that we're going to... Uh, Jerry will talk about later and actually might subsidise the cost so we can do a couple of class actions both on, we're talking about unsecured, a month we'll touch on that in a second, unsecured credit cards, okay? Not cars, not homes, there are other processes for that and they are slightly different, but I want to do your thing. Yeah, sorry, I should have uh, prefaced that by saying that what I'm talking about is unsecured debts here, so personal loans, credit credit cards. We have done a lot of cars. Cars are still a secure debt. We, we did a car ourselves uh, in 2008. We did a Toyota Yaris. Still have it. Heard nothing through GE. Nothing. So you can do it, but the trick there is to get the car out of harm's way. And, uh, you know, it's it, it, the, the, the reality is they may probably 20 or 30% of the time send a repo guy, big hairy scary guy, to come and collect the car. So... You need to get the car out of harm's way. You know, we've had a couple of clients have thought, oh, no, it won't happen to me. And we've had some really funny incidences with that. But they'll play tricks. They'll, uh, we had one client where they called him up and said, because uh, they'll come to your house and they have absolutely no right to be on your property. So you can send them scurrying and they know this. You just say, hey, don't come here and don't threaten me and leave my property. You've got 10 seconds or I'll call the police. And they will leave. If they had any lawful right there to get your car, they would come with the police and a warrant to pick it up. Uh, but, you know, they, they played the usual tricks of, we had one guy, they called him up, he was a business coach, and they said, oh, we're interested in some business coaching, uh, uh, could you meet us at the Breakfast Creek Hotel? Went to the Breakfast Creek Hotel at one o'clock, the sitting, sitting, one twenty, not there, went out to his car to get the guy's details, car's gone. <laughs> so in a public place, they'll just pick it up. Um, a lady who's worked for us, uh, Tracy, they actually followed her, so they waited till she left her home, they followed her to a car park, then they had a, a tow truck park at the front and the repo guy at the back, the police were called. Uh, they actually assaulted her. So, gee, I'm doing a good sell. Uh, so they assaulted her. That she called me on the spot, and I spoke to the police, and I said, "You have no court order here." They actually broke the law. There was no court order. The police had no right 
to allow that repo guy to, to pick the car up. He said, well, she owes the money. I said, no, no, that's an allegation. There's been no court order. So they picked the car up. She was only one month behind, by the way, in her, in her payment. Um, so she made the month's payment, picked the car up, and then listened to us and moved the car away. It still has the car. Uh, but you know, you need to listen to the instructions if you're going to do this. It's a matter of just getting the car out of the way for a, for a few months because they'll only try a few times. Repo guys get paid if they pick the car up. So if they can't find the car, do you think they're going to keep trying? There's always someone easier. There's always someone easier that they're going to, that they're going to get the money out. That collection tactic. Yep. It's if you're really, I'm one of the, the most difficult people to deal with when it comes to debt collectors. They hate dealing with me. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Horror shit! Oh, what are you ringing me for? You know, he died. He's not he no here no more. <laughs> And, and I, I actually just get the phone because, of course, I know that they're funny. Their phone lines turn it on and I just leave it. Yeah, I'll just get him for you. I answer them all the time, yeah. I leave it and they sit there and I'll sit there for six minutes or eight minutes. And I know that's costing you money. It's only a small win, but it gives me a thrill, so I do it. <laughs> um, and I do, and I have a whole range of accents that I can... That I can and they, they must, they have no idea. They, they move me from debt collection company to debt collection company to... Come on, do your fat bastard. You make me sick in my belly. <laughs> well, his wife's Scottish, and go, oh, oh, aye. Yeah, you go, oh, aye. What's he say? He's, um, he's oh, I'm dead sexy. <laughs> oh, get in my belly. <laughs> we digress. So that's, that's, well, I'll do questions at the end. I did um, have one guy that threatened to bash me just recently, but, and then the, when I told him he was being recorded, he was, he was quite aggressive, and he, and he just stopped me. And then it was like the first to speak losers. <laughs> <laughs> and I waited and waited and he goes, well, well, well you started it. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing because honestly you have to have a bit of fun with it's it. It's, it's, it can be a heavy dark time when people are coming out of it. But to come out the other side, like I'm debt free and it's such a great feeling. And I know there's people that we've helped in the room who are debt free now and it's, it is liberating, which is why we call it the Credit Liberation Foundation that's set up to do that. But that's unsecured debt. Uh, unsecured debt, I say easy peasy. You know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if we mentioned yesterday, but it's like fines. It's the same with the debt. It's a game of tennis. They're going to serve. You need to hit it back with top spin. If you think you're going to hit a top spin winner, then good luck. And, and that may happen, but generally they're going to hit it back, maybe with a bit of slice on it, and you need to hit it again. And, and it's a game of outlast, yeah. outmanoeuvre, and they uh, frustrate. Power you yeah. So if you give them the power, then they're going to rule you and make your life a misery. But if you, if you have the power, they don't know, they're certainly going to have a react in those instances. And, and I always get um, comments about, okay, you've got to you know, get one piece of paper, it's a, it's a default notice or something from the bank, and we're about to take legal action or the rest of it. It's still a piece of paper, so you've got a piece of paper with, you know, nice, friendly, polite words and document on this side, and you've got one on this side, the same white piece of paper, same black letters on it, just arranged in a different format. They're exactly the same physical pieces of paper, but you give one more power than the other. As soon as you realise that, well, they're just letters, they have, just, I have the same right to have a crack at them and, 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 and find them and infringe them or, or to fault them, then you realise that the power comes back to you. The only document you really need to take notice of is if it's a court-ordered document, because it will have a court time frame which you need to comply with, otherwise you then go off the consequences, which is where if you do the process with due or you know the other team, then it just rolls through and we get we get to those on time, and then someone like Jerry or you know uh, anyone else that, that's dealing with them um, in court can actually attend for you and make sure you don't get further into that rabbit hole. It's important you remain honourable, so if they write to you, you need to write back. Uh, and what we say to people is that we are here as a platform for you. We don't profess to have all the magic bullets. What we actually recommend you do is continue your study because when it comes time to writing to the debt collectors, we have templates, but it's a really good exercise and I've done this with, with lots of clients over the years. Uh, and there's one guy, Jock Barnes, who was an Australian surfing champion for a couple of years. He did the process through us on, I think, about six different matters. And when he started getting the debt collector letters, he's one of the first guys I tried this on a few years ago. I said, listen, Jock, have, have you continued to study? Yep, yep, I have. I said, well, why don't you sit in front of a blank piece of paper or a blank computer, read your four-stage process again, and just sit and write what you think you should write. And it was absolutely incredible. The letters that he wrote, I didn't have to amend one little bit. So sometimes it's a good idea to, to obviously continue your study, but take your training wheels off and have a go yourself because that is truly then the empowerment. When you've got that and you can write that letter from your own volition and your own knowledge, then you've won. So that's really important. So we've been talking about uh, unsecured debts. I'd like to say they're easy peasy. I feel really confident with unsecured debts. Mortgages are a different matter. We've done about 35, 40 mortgages. There's about 12 of them that have been left alone. 
Uh, the others all got harassed, of course, because they feel they have a, uh, some collateral over property, which is the right of use of a title on a DP lot map, we're going to talk about later. So yeah, we're actually getting to the case where we might just hand them back and say, yep, you're happy. We're happy for you to have the title, but we're going to keep the land in the house. But, uh, but the reality is that some of those got uh, uh, pursued. Some of the clients just didn't do the study. As much as we say, continue to do the study. They absolutely panicked and they put the white flag up, uh, recapitalised the loan and continued on. Um, the 12 that got left alone, we were scratching our heads for a while going, why is that? And we've kind of worked out that the majority of those were, or all of them were, low dock loans. Does everyone know what a low dock loan is? Yeah. Okay, so well, for those that don't, I saw a few people like that. Basically in the, the bad old days, it's pretty hard to do them now, uh, a broker could turn up and you could actually just sign a stat deck saying, I'm self-employed, I earn 150000 a year, your accountant would write a little dodgy letter on the side, loan approved, done. No, no verification. Basically it's a, what was called like in the old days an equity loan. So a lot of them were low dock loans where we believe there was some mischief on behalf of the broker and the bank. They certainly don't want to disclose that because there's been a lot of cases, even here in Australia, I think there was a class action of 20 against Bank of Queensland and they won. And the other one was... Um Brisbane-based, I can't think of the name, yeah. but they, they, they won, but they were then put from the Supreme Court back to the High Court because they judged the court the bank's doing it. Yeah. So uh, they were low dock loans and or in what we call a negative equity position and quite a negative equity position. So we all know what the property market's done in the last few years. So these people were buying homes for 500000 on 90% uh, or 95% lens. The market's dropped 30 or 40%. The loan's in a negative equity position and we believe the banks don't want to expose their uh, their capital position right now. Even though the shadow ledger is very healthy, the, the regular ledger is probably a bit dicey at the moment. So those 12 people have been left alone. But they were the likes of the loans of Bluestone and Pepper and uh, probably there's people in the room who have loans through them. The, the fringe Resimac, the, the fringe dwellers. Uh, I want to introduce you now to Stu. Do you want to come down, Stu? Oh, sorry, I'll just go back to this, this last bit here. I forgot one bit because it's quite important. I'll stand again. Where I say here, that remember this is every bit an internal process than an external process. Yes, we're going to give you letters and you're going to deal with it e externally. But I believe this is every bit, like Max was talking before, an internal process. Where you realise the fraud that's gone on, you realise how powerful you are, you start realising the terminology that's been used against you, what real property is, uh, and take it on internally, and that's where, that's where your liberation is going to come from, not all the tricky letters that we can help you with. So Stuart uh, is part of the Credit Liberation uh, Foundation. Stuart's a bit like AB um, yeah, in stature, uh, no, in, uh, in personality, in that he doesn't let things, he doesn't let things go. Uh, and uh, if you want to just share quickly, Stuart, your situation with your mortgage, because uh, uh, Stuart's a bit of a hero of mine. He's really taken this on board of his own volition, of his own study, and he's now uh, cleared his mortgage using some very clever processes. So just very quickly, Stuart. So as you can see, it's, it's uh, pioneering stuff and you've got to grow a set to do it, but uh, it can be done. Now that's with a mortgage. So uh, if you're looking at unsecured stuff, then have a chat with Stuart in one of the breaks. And again, we want you guys to get the value of your ticket. I don't want you to feel like we're selling from the stage, but if you want to do the debt process, and I know there's people that do because they've crash tackled me at the breaks, then go and see Stuart uh, or Cherie or, or tick that box when you get your feedback form. Um, and uh, Stuart can help you out. I think you're in good hands with this bloke and, and AB by his side as well. So what we're going to do now is uh, open it up to question time just for a few minutes. And the answer is no, because you, you through the four stage process and then dealing with debt collectors, you write to them and you set out the terms like any else you're dealing with. What Stuart did was due process and disclosure. So they can't say he had to force them, he told them what the process was, he gave them warning. Same with the debt collector. You, you get anything, first phone call, first letter from the debt collector, you write to them and say, you're harassing me, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You're a third, the, term, the technical term is your third party interloper. Okay, and as a third party interloper, that, that then puts them into the criminal realm. Okay, it's obtaining money by a menace. Okay, it's extortion, call it whatever you like. But these people do have, have no right, they're not party to the loan, they're not party to the agreement, they can't demand money from you, and they will usually do it with menace. So up front you tell them, here's the deal, 
here's my letter, only deal with me in writing if you feel you have something, um, you, you, the, 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 uh, obviously it counters what I've said to you, and we provide them a 47 point disclosure document that they have to say, oh, it's assignment, that we bought the debt, we assigned the debt, Gunnar will tell you a good story about buying debt um, a bit later, but the fact is, is you can't assign, you can't assign that right away. It's usually done by a tripartite agreement. You can't, without one of the parties to it being aware that the debt has been sold. So you put them on those up front. And do you use the term third party? I do, absolutely. Third party, I use the term extortion. I use uh, threat of obtaining money by amounts. Um, so uh, the other thing too is the second that they ring you and leave a message, you then have the right to go to COSL, C-O-S-L, which is the Credit Ombudsman Service, and report them for extortion and for um, basically breaching what you've, what you've asked them to do. Now that's a really important thing because that stops them in the tracks. They cannot contact you one more time ever until the matter is resolved. And if they do, they lose their uh, Australian credit license, the ACL. They also can't list you on VADA and they can't start or commence court action or recovery action. Then you then have to deal with COSL who are useless. They are morons, okay? They're banking stooges, but at the same time... It's still a useful tool. 30 mm. to 60 days it'll buy you as far as dealing with debt collectors are concerned. You'd have to record that in order to prove it though, wouldn't you? The COSL? If they did ring you and you'd already... Oh, look, I would try to record everything. I record everything. I record everything. If you can, it's so easy on your phone. But if you've got your phone, especially with iPhones and Androids, you just, you just hit the video and have it right next to you as, as you're talking. It's a really easy thing to do nowadays. And if, you, if you're going to go through the process, invest in a recorder. Just get an app from, um, you can get Call Record or whatever those uh, you know, other ones are from iPhone. And you just, you just I'll, call call I'll call Record. 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 Call call this is Jerry, by the way. It's free. I've downloaded I always tell them, I, I, I enjoy, they hang out straight away, you tell them you're recording the call. You just, just you don't have to go through the whole, the whole game. Uh, we're recording yeah. this for, for training purposes. <laughs> I'm in training. Look, I'm recording this for training purposes. I have gone to the expert too and said, this one that uses against you in court, so go ahead and say whatever you like. And they go, oh, please, just let it go. Yeah, they're, they're a bit more difficult because when you're dealing with the service that's been provided, so they, 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 yeah, your argument is actually over the value of the service. You say, well, it's only worth 10 bucks a megawatt or whatever they charge, and, and they say, well, no, it's worth 100. So you have actually then, you've received the service, so it's a different, it, it's a different process to that. Yeah, that's a good point. We had a client years and years ago who tried this against Repco, um, and one of our administrators did the process, and then, of course, it backfired. Repco took him to court, and I rang him, and I said, oh, I didn't know Repco had a finance department. He said, no, no, he was a mechanic, and it was for carburetors and gaskets and... Are they mechanical devices? They are. Sounded good. Um, uh, and I said to him, you can't do that, mate. That's not honourable. If you were supplied a good or a service, um, you can't do it. This process is for the creation or exposing the creation of money out of thin air. The way that you do that is if you finance the acquisition of those parts through a bank who didn't have the money in the first place, so there's no injured party, there's no victim, and then you can write up the bank or go inside the side. The four stage process itself is you get a client um, manager, if for want of a better term, if you want to use the commercial term, and they essentially they're available to you for as much as you need them. Usually by email, because of course you can imagine you know, heaps of phone calls. And we try to we try to manage your expectations. You know, you're gonna get really nasty letters that are gonna freak you out, you know, legal action and threats and repossession and sheriffs and bailiffs. But once you actually accept and um, expect them to come through and you realise that you don't have they don't have that much power over you, then you can sort of temper your, your fear, write an email to Stu or to any of the other team and then they'll basically email and respond and if, it's, if you're really panicked at it, you can get the phone and you can talk to them. So all the way right through the process, there is a there's a flow chart that goes out with the um, with the process as well. That that obviously it's it's not never ending. There's a point of okay, so we get to this point and then you then get picked up by a debt collector down the track and you need three more letters, or there's a cost per letter that goes along. That wasn't me, by the way. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, so can you well, I just wanted to cover a bit more what ABC said. So there's a standard four-stage process that everyone goes through. That's, uh, that's standard for everybody. From there, Stu uh, issues you a flow chart because we don't know whether you're going to hear nothing. I did four matters, I heard nothing. 
Uh, that was five years ago. Things have changed. So you may hear nothing. You, it may get sold to a debt collector. You may get uh, a legal letter. So there's, there's different uh, areas then, and we notice your... Because we don't know what the process is going to be from there. Uh, but the, the cost is, I think it's 12.70 for, or 12.50 or something for the first matter, and then 6.50 thereafter. 750 there after something like that because obviously if you do more than one matter at a time it's easier for the administration team uh, to put it together uh, the irony is that most people pay us by a credit card and then write it off <laughs> <laughs> so, so what it is is the, um, the 12 70 would be the three and five stuff now so it, it's, oh, okay. we, we started at 1970 was for two debts and we somebody just want to do one because again, we're happy for you just to do one debt with us and go and do your other six by yourself. Like, we don't have to, you don't have to go, oh, I've got seven credit cards, that's going to cost me a fortune. You, if you're willing to study and work with the team as you go, you just pay for the one. So we brought that back to 1500 bucks for one debt. And you think about the structure, how long that takes, and getting a letter written by an accountant or a lawyer that they could have cost it. Well, we write sometimes up to eight letters, sometimes 12 letters in that process. So it, it's actually quite a cheap process from our time, from our services point of view. But I always tell people there's an education. Like when you get through the first one, you need the second one, your third one. It's a very, it's, a, it's an investment in, in I think research and education for, for anyone that takes it on. And then you get really ballsy with it, and you can you can you know, okay, well, I'll do the, the, the credit card with the debt collector now. If you do one of those, you might have six or seven of those. And then go and start your own CLF. Go and start. We don't own, we don't have any ownership over the intellectual property that we've created. Once you do the process, it's yours. Go and start your own CLF. I want all of you to go and start your own CLF. These banks, the quicker we bring them down, the better. But we need to come up with a new system.